Okay, so in this video, it'll be part one of two on protein synthesis. So in this video, we're gonna talk about transcription, and then the very next video will be translation. Okay, so let's talk about protein synthesis and what it means. So it's in the name, synthesis. Here we're gonna talk about how we build proteins. And you may have learned, oh, proteins are made of amino acids and ribosomes make proteins. But now we get to study the specifics of it all. So in general, uh, protein synthesis is basically how we get the directions about how to build proteins from our DNA. When we talk about genetics and our genes, our genes are basically the directions in our DNA of how to make proteins. Like our entire like being and phenotypes are based on proteins. So the DNA oftentimes gets a lot of credit in life as being the molecule of inheritance. But really it comes down to it's proteins. Proteins are what matter. And so our entire phenotype is based on the presence or absence of particular proteins. So what we're gonna see is, well, how do you get those directions from our genes, from our genetics into an actual protein? Okay, so um, there are two steps. We have transcription, which looks like my face is in the way, transcription and translation. So um, let's go ahead and just see a general overview. So here, now, truthfully, uh, it's a pet peeve of mine when uh, we think of chromosomes in a like a, an X shape. This only exists after S phase of the cell cycle until um, like M phase when they separate. So we're going to go ahead and just cover uh, one of these. So here in our chromosomes, we have our genes. And our, our DNA, uh, truthfully, um, only about 1% of our DNA is our actual genes. A lot of our DNA is actually non-coding uh, sequences, meaning they don't code for proteins. But our genes are what code for proteins. So what we are going to learn is how do we get that, that code or those directions from our genes in DNA, which are nucleotides, into a protein which is made of amino acids. So our first step is to copy those directions. We copy them into RNA. And RNA is also made out of nucleotides. And this is where that name transcription, like think about, you know, thousands of years ago, scribes were the ones who like copied down like manuscripts and text. And so here we're copying down, we're transcribing uh, that code into messenger RNA. And then in the second step of protein synthesis, we have translation. Now think about the word translate, where you take um, and you translate maybe from English to Spanish. Here, we're going to translate that code from nucleic acids or and nucleotides into amino acids. We're like totally translating it into a different macro molecule. It's beautiful. So the next step where we actually read that code and build the protein is translation. So here's a drawing I made about 10 years ago. Uh, but basically, these uh, processes happen in the nucleus and the cytoplasm of eukaryotes. Now for prokaryotes, they also happen, but they don't have a nucleus. So it's all happening in the cytoplasm. So our first uh, step that we're gonna focus on is translation and it, oh, transcription. And transcription is basically how we make that messenger RNA, how we copy the DNA into RNA. Uh, a common mistake I see from students is they say the DNA is turned into RNA, false. The DNA is still there in the nucleus. We're just copying it into RNA. Um, it's kind of like if your friend copies your homework. You still have your original homework. Now there's just a copy. <laughs> okay, so now uh, the messenger RNA that will leave the nucleus and in the cytoplasm or on the refiar, it'll find a ribosome. And it's there at the ribosome where amino acids are joined together to form a polypeptide in the process called translation. Okay, so let's go ahead and see. So we have prokaryotic cells on Earth and we have eukaryotic cells on Earth. And all cells on Earth do protein synthesis. So they both um, have transcription and they both have translation. But when you, what you see in this picture here is that the location of where they happen is different. Uh, for prokaryotes, they don't have a nucleus, so they're both happening within the cytoplasm. But in eukaryotes, transcription happens first in the nucleus, followed by translation uh, with a ribosome 
in the cytoplasm. So what we're going to learn here about transcription is true uh, for both prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Um, now, another difference between the two is that eukaryotes have a step called RNA processing that we'll talk about towards the end of this video. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at um, transcription. So transcription is basically making mRNA, uh, messenger RNA. There are multiple kinds of RNA, but as a refresher from an earlier uh, video, RNA is our single-stranded nucleic acid made out of four different nitrogen or four different nucleotides uh, with four different nitrogen bases a u c and g so here rna has uracil instead of thymine um, another difference is it has ribose instead of deoxyribose compared to dna um, but it's built in the same five to three prime direction that we saw when we learned how dna was replicated and synthesized all right there are a lot of different kinds of rna uh, we will talk about a few of them as we go through um, our unit on molecular cell biology. So we won't talk about all of them in this video um, or even the next, but as the unit goes on. Okay, so let's go ahead again. We're looking at um, this transcription step, taking our gene in DNA and transcribing it into messenger RNA. So let's go ahead and look at our beautiful double helix, our double stranded DNA with our three primes and our five prime ends. So we need an enzyme uh, to build this messenger RNA. So here our enzyme is RNA polymerase. And RNA polymerase is the enzyme that will build messenger RNA. And uh, there's actually multiple kinds of RNA polymerase. RNA polymerases will also build tRNA, rRNA, et cetera. So they will follow base pairing rules, uh, like we saw before, A pairs with U, because uh, there are no Ts in RNA, uh, and then C pairs with G. And so um, what's going to happen is RNA polymerase is going to open up just the section of DNA where the gene is located, where it's transcribing. It doesn't unzip the whole double helix. It's going to form basically what we call is a transcription uh, bubble. So just the section of DNA we want to work with is going to be unwound and opened up. So now this RNA polymerase can begin to a uh, base pair and you copy the code from DNA into an RNA like transcript into a strand of single stranded RNA. Now, earlier, just a slide or two ago, I mentioned that messenger R or RNA, messenger RNA, is made from the five prime to three prime direction. So now here we have two strands of DNA to choose from. We're only going to use one strand um, as our template or as our guide in building the messenger RNA. So I'm going to like make this RNA polymerase like in the back so we can see the nucleotides a little easier. So here, the messenger RNA is synthesized from the five prime to the three prime direction. So like when we saw DNA replication, I RNA polymerase can only add on to that three prime end. So now, which strand of DNA do we use? Well, uh, the RNA is going to be anti-parallel to the DNA. So in this case here, we're actually going to pick the top strand as the strand that allows us to build the RNA from five prime to three prime. And we're gonna use base pairing rules. Here I have a G, so my nucleotide in RNA, I will add, is a C. And so here we have an A, and normally if this was DNA, we'd go A pairs with T. But there are no thymines in RNA, so instead we're gonna add a uracil, a U, a nitrogen base here. And so a uh, base pairing continues. You can see we started at the five prime end and we're adding on to that three prime end of the growing messenger RNA. All right. Uh, RNA polymerase, though. Oh, that's on a timer. Hold on. Hold on. Um, so RNA polymerase is going to continue to read or move down that DNA strand. And what we see here, I'm going to like cover up with some of the DNA nucleotides. You can see those RNA that single strand of RNA that's already beginning to form kind of like tail, like trails off. It does not stay attached to the DNA nucleotides. It will break free of that DNA. And so here, um, RNA polymerase has moved down and it will continue to do base pairing rules and build that RNA uh, strand. So this 
is transcription. And in eukaryotes, it's happening in the nucleus because that's where we find our DNA. In prokaryotes, it's happening within the cytoplasm because they don't have a nucleus. Okay, so eventually you get to the end of the gene. And now, um, so let's see what this says. Okay, so then as RNA polymerase um, finishes, it moves, and then the double helix will wind back up. And now that RNA strand, it's single stranded RNA that was built from five prime to three prime is now free from that DNA uh, double helix. The double helix is now, or the DNA is back in a double helix, safe and sound within the nucleus. Now this messenger RNA though, doesn't stay in the nucleus. It's going to leave um, through a nuclear pore, if it's in a eukaryote, and enter into either the ref yard, where it'll be read by a ribosome there, or it'll enter into the cytoplasm for a free floating ribosome uh, to translate um, a protein from it. Okay, so um, once the gene has been transcribed, the single-stranded mRNA carries the directions on how to build a protein now to a ribosome. And so here, um, let's see what I want to emphasize is we've basically taken that gene and that code for how to build a protein and we've copied it into like a disposable nucleic acid. Like our chromosomes, we need safe in our nucleus. But RNA, you can just keep making more copies of it. So you can think of it as like a disposable uh, type of messenger. Like once it's read in a uh, in translation, then it can be like broken apart back into individual amino acids. Okay, so let's go ahead and practice a little bit with um, how do we know uh, which strand to use in building the messenger RNA, like which strand of the DNA will be chosen. So here I have a double helix and let's pretend RNA polymerase is coming in, right? And so we have that transcription bubble and the DNA, the double helix is separated um, and RNA is built from five prime to three prime, and it runs anti-parallel to DNA. So what we are looking for is which of these two DNA strands, um, let's see if you can figure out uh, which strand is gonna be used to build our RNA. So we're gonna try and think, okay, if RNA is built from five to three, we're looking for the DNA strand that's built from three to five because they're gonna run anti-parallel to each other. Okay, so then here, this bottom strand is going to be what we call the template strand. So this strand that we use is called the template strand. This is the transcribed strand, the strand that is used to copy the code into RNA. And then we have the other side though, because remember DNA is a double helix. So the other strand is called the coding strand which to me I feel is a bit confusing because you would think the coding strand is what's coding for the RNA, but that's not the case. Here, it's the template strand is acting as our guide of how to build that messenger RNA. So our coding strand is untranscribed DNA. Okay, so um, the DNA strand acts as a, oh, this here, if you are an AP bio, these words are copy and pasted from College Board, where it says, um, they say that the DNA strand acting as the template strand can also be referred to though as the non-coding strand, the minus strand, or the anti-sense strand. So in any word problem or question, uh, they may be talking about the template strand, but then call it the anti-sense strand, or the minus strand, or the non-coding strand. Okay, so just maybe make a note of that. All right, so anyway, then the messenger RNA continues um, until the end of the gene is reached. All right, so let's go ahead and um, see here. So if I have this double helix or this DNA, reasons I know it's DNA is because there's T's for thymine and there's two strands and they're anti-parallel. So if RNA polymerase is moving in this direction, which strand is going to be the template strand? or the antisense strand, same thing. So here, um, RNA is built from five to three. So we're, I'm just gonna open up our double helix and I want you to think about it. If RNA is built from five to three, well, that means our top strand is anti-parallel to that and that'll be our template strand. Ooh, you notice that anytime we would have written a T, now there's a U. Okay, so there's our messenger RNA. Um, now, what do you notice about the RNA 
with the coding strand. Remember, it's that bottom one we didn't use. It's called the coding strand. And really what you should notice is that they're exactly the same, except for anywhere that there was a T, now there's a U in the RNA. Okay, so if RNA polymerase is moving in this direction, then that would make the bottom strand our template strand. Okay. All right, all right. So now let's go ahead and think about this, though. In the very beginning of this uh, PowerPoint, I mentioned, or video, I mentioned that only like 1% of our DNA actually codes for genes. So how the heck does uh, RNA polymerase even know where to begin transcription? Like, for example, on chromosome number one, we have almost 250 million base pairs. A goes with T, C goes with G, and 2,000 genes. So we have all of these genes on our first chromosome, um, but like where or how does RNA polymerase know that that is where it starts, right? So I also want to take this time to talk about the section of DNA between genes. It doesn't code for anything. We actually will call this non-coding DNA. If you ever come across the terminology non-coding DNA, that means it's DNA that's not part of a gene. It's not coding for a protein. Now, this is important because if a mutation happens here in the non-coding section, it doesn't matter for our phenotypes. It doesn't matter because it's not in the gene that codes for proteins. Okay, so how does RNA polymerase know where to attach, right, to do transcription? So let's go ahead and, um, like, figure that out. So, again, here's the coding region is what codes for genes, and non-coding regions don't code for genes. Okay, so uh, right before, so here I'm going to use a word uh, called upstream. Upstream means like before. Uh, so I grew up fishing and, you know, it'd be very easy to tell my dad, hey, I'm going to go upstream. The water's going this way. I'm going to go in the opposite direction. So like here in this gene, if we're reading it, maybe from left to right, upstream would be like moving towards the left. Okay, so upstream of the gene or before the gene, uh, there's a, a region called the promoter sequence. And the promoter sequence is where RNA polymerase can begin transcription. And the template strand is determined here. So when RNA polymerase attaches, this is where the fives and the threes and all of that will be figured out. And then they'll figure out, oh, okay, I'm going to use the top strand. Oh, I'll use the bottom strand as my template to build the messenger RNA from five to three. Okay, so, um, but how does RNA polymerase know where a promoter is? Because if we remember, DNA is made out of um, nucleotides, A, T, C, and G. So we have all these millions of base pairs only out of A's, T's, C's, and G's. How the heck can RNA polymerase identify a promoter sequence, right? Well, it turns out in every single promoter, there's a repeating sequence. T pairs with A, A pairs with T, T pairs with A, A pairs with T. So we actually call this the Tata -ta box. It's not a literal box added onto the DNA, but it's basically because of that sequence forms like a square shape. So every promoter sequence has what we call a Tata -ta box. And this Tata -ta box is how RNA polymerase uh, can identify a promoter region. So, and then how does it know to stop? Well, that's still being studied in eukaryotes, um, but in like prokaryotes, there's actually a terminator sequence that signals stopping. Uh, but the last I read a few years ago is in eukaryotes, they're still figuring that out. Okay, so what we have learned so far is true for both prokaryotes and eukaryotes. They both have promoter sequences with the Tata -ta box. They both use RNA polymerase. They both have make single-stranded RNA from five to three uh, following base pairing rules. So everything we've learned is true for both. Now, though, we're going to learn a little bit more about eukaryotes and how eukaryotes are more specific. So here in eukaryotes, oops, do you notice the word is regulation is red here? So what we're going to do is we're talking about, like, how do we regulate? We're not transcribing all, like, we have 25 to 30,000 genes in our body, um, in every cell. We're not transcribing all 25 to 30,000 genes all the time. That'd be so wasteful uh, using up our amino acids and our nucleotides. So we have a way to regulate when we turn on and turn off our genes. Like when do we transcribe them? So one step in the regulation process that eukaryotes have are we have these extra proteins called transcription 
factors. Uh, we've seen a little bit about transcription factors in cell communication, and we'll see even more if you're an AP Bio in 6.5 on uh, regulating gene expression. But anyway, so here we have these transcription factors and look where they attached. They attached to the promoter sequence. Okay, okay. So now here, these transcription factors are what help RNA polymerase attach and begin transcription. So without the transcription factors in eukaryotes, we wouldn't be able to do transcription. Like RNA polymerase needs those to start the process. So in eukaryotes, these are proteins called transcription factors, and they attach the promoter sequence to help turn on or turn off a gene expression. We have a whole nother uh, video on that alone. Okay, so again, how do they know where to attach? It's that ta, -ta box. Okay, in the promoter sequence. All right, all right. And uh, our last little conversation is about that red term RNA processing. So now this only happens in eukaryotes. It does not happen in bacteria. Bacteria and archaeans, prokaryotes, do not undergo RNA processing. This is just in eukaryotic cells. Okay, so here I have a strand of messenger RNA. So we call this pre-mRNA. It was freshly made by RNA polymerase in a nucleus. I have my five prime end, I have my three prime end. Okay, okay. Now there's three things we're gonna do in what's called RNA processing. So we're gonna like edit up this RNA um, to make what we call mature RNA. So the first thing that's gonna happen is we're gonna add a modified guanine nucleotide. You can see here it has three phosphate groups. Um, and this basically helps um, like protect the beginning of the messenger RNA as it leaves the nucleus and enters into the cytoplasm. It's also gonna help um, the messenger RNA to attach to the ribosome. So it helps in the second step of translation. Now, this is the next part is fun. I think. Um, it's also pretty important. So a second thing that happens in our uh, RNA, we have regions that we want to keep and we have some regions of our, some nucleotides that we want to cut out. They're in the way. So uh, what we do is we're going to actually cut out areas called introns. They're in the way or they're in between the important parts. Okay, so we're gonna remove the introns and what we are left with are called exons. So here, the exons are going to be spliced together to like, it's actually gonna make a shorter messenger RNA. So now, uh, my sweet students, so in truth, um, how we cut out the introns and splice together the exons can be different. Um, each time. It's called alternative RNA splicing, and that'll be discussed in a later video. But basically, we can edit a strand of RNA in different ways. So from one gene, one sequence in the DNA could actually make multiple different RNAs, depending on how we edit it at this step. So that is one of the reasons why we have 25 to 30,000 genes in our DNA, but over 100,000 different proteins in our body because we can make different mRNAs from the same gene, all depending on how we edit. So again, we cut out our introns and we splice together exons. So those remaining parts are called exons. Okay, and then the third step and final step of RNA processing is we add a poly A tail. A poly A tail means like poly, many, adenines. So adenines are those A nucleotides. Now this is gonna help prevent the messenger RNA from getting degraded too quickly in um, the cytoplasm. So as soon as messenger RNA enters into the cytoplasm, there's gonna be enzymes in the cytoplasm that come and start to cut off the tail part, like nucleotide by nucleotide by nucleotide. Um, it's called hyd like using uh, hydrolysis, like to cut off and break those bonds. So on mRNAs, we can add anywhere from 50 to 250 adenines to extend the life of the messenger RNA within the cytoplasm. So here we have our mature mRNA. So to summarize just real quick, we have exons are the ones you keep and introns are the ones that are removed. So in our pre mRNA, um, basically we're gonna add a five prime, oh, cut out the introns, splice together the exons, 
We're going to add a five prime cap and a poly A tail. So those are your three steps in making mature mRNA that will then leave the nucleus and go to a cytoplasm. Okay. Um, to find a ribosome. But now our last topic this is our last slide in this video is how do the introns get spliced out? Or like, how are they cut out? So we have these really cool things called SNRPs. Um, and SNRPs, oh, small nuclear RNA and proteins, I think is what it stands for. And they're used to splice out uh, the introns. So there's actually like recognition sites. There's actually like sites where that they recognize, oh, there's an intron, let's cut it out. So a SNRP is made out of small nuclear RNA, uh, which is the green part there, as well as proteins, which is the purple part. So uh, some SNRPs will come to the, like the border or the boundary between an exon and an intron. So you can see where that red and um, blue meet, like that, <laughs> I don't know, spot. So here you have some SNRPs. They're gonna go to that like splice site and they will actually like uh, fold the, R the RNA and bring the two exons together and then splice out that intron and then bond together the two exons. Now this group of SNRPs uh, is called, um, there's our intron. Oh, look at our two exons in our mature mRNA. Okay, okay. Uh, but this group of SNRPs is called a spliceosome. So the spliceosome is what cuts out those in splices out those introns and then pairs together our exons in the process of um, making mature mRNA. All right, so then our next video will pick up with, well, what do we do with that mature mRNA? Like how do we use it to build a protein? Okay, good job.